Hello, Worms Gab, all your edge. We're a month away from the start of the season, so with that in mind, it's nice to do something a bit different and catch up with a former Nottingham Forest player to discuss their career and life today. With that in mind, I'm delighted to be joined by a promotion winner, a player who finished third in the Premier League and UEFA Cup quarter finalist in former Reds midfielder David Phillips. David, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. Oh no, it's good. It's good to catch up with players, especially from an era where there was uh, plenty of success for Forest. Um, I guess when you joined the club, it wasn't necessarily a case of success. I mean, I think I'm right in saying you you left Norwich City, who'd had a really good season in the top flight, to come to Forest, who were in a you know certainly a state of transition, if not a state of turmoil after Brian Clough left. What made you make the move? Because it feels to me, from the outside looking in, a, a risky transfer. What was the thinking behind it? Yeah, I say people always turn around and say, uh, you know, why did you go and do it? Um, but the the contract that was offered to me at Norwich City Football Club was not the contract that I was looking for. And um, it was quite um, visible um, from Mike Walker um, that it wasn't going to be a case that the, the contract was going to be renewed just purely on the, the financial issues and, and length of contract. And um, I just decided there and then it was a, maybe an opportunity to move on. I had a, an excellent season for Norwich that year. Um, we got them into the uh, UEFA Cup. And um, I just thought, well, this is an opportunity for, for me to move on. I've been used to do, been doing it. You know, my father was in the Royal Air Force. We travelled around places here, there and everywhere. And, and I just thought with, with Nottingham Forest, you know, what a great adventure and what a great opportunity to, to help the club. What are your first impressions then? Because like you said, a great manager had left, a new manager had come in. What kind of club did you feel you were walking into once you'd been there for a couple of days? Well, I must say, when you when you walk into the uh, the change rooms, you see the likes of Stuart Pearce you know, being there. You think, well, you know, why is this club where they are? And, um, you know, for the first couple of days, it was a case of like, you know, they were a little bit uncertain about, you know, what was going on with their pre-season, et cetera. Um, and, and things weren't looking particularly good, you know, with, with Brian Clough leaving, uh, the position that they were in, in the, you know, in Division One, as it was at the, in those days. Um, and thinking that, you know, this, this club is too big to go down into the Division One. So they really wanted to get back up into the Premier League. And, uh, you know, there's always a... I say speculation with the, the Forest fans, etc., thinking, well, you know, we should deserve to go up there. But the season prior to that was not a particularly good one. And uh, I just felt that with the opportunity of moving to a bigger club, uh, not being disrespectful to, to Norwich City Football Club, with the history that Nottingham Forest had, you know, winning two European Cups and, uh, you know, being great in Europe as well. And, and, and with the history and the players that they've had as well, um, I thought it was a, a great opportunity for, for me to join a, a fantastic club. Were you coming in as a direct replacement for Roy Keane? Was that how it was sold to you, or you to play a different role in midfield? Yeah, it was. It was quite funny because um, one of the first days that I turned up, um, I bumped into uh, to Kingsley Black, and uh, KB. He was a little bit distraught at the time, and you know, I was having a chat with KB, and I was saying, you know, how's things and how's season going, blah blah, pre season going, and he's going, well, not too good, fellow. You know, um, he said you're here to take my place, aren't you? I said, well, no, I'm not here to take your place, KB. I said, uh, I'm actually here to come in and replace Roy Keane, um, which was a huge, you know, player to come in and uh, take over. But um, KB and I then became instantly great friends because um, he thought with me playing at Norwich City, mainly on the left-hand side, that um, I was going to take his place. But, you know, Frank Clark had already alluded to the fact that he wanted me to come in replace uh, Roy Keane um, and the rest is history from there. How did the fans take to you initially? I know Roy was a young player when he left but he'd done so well for Forrest and everyone could see how good he was already was and going to be. Were you welcomed with open arm by, arms by the fans or were they sceptical about you? I think to start off with they would be sceptical uh, knowing that I was uh, playing as a, a left-sided midfielder at the time with Norwich City working down that left flank with Mark Bowen but even so, uh, you know, I, I played in every position on the park, played central midfield many, many times, you know, international wise as well. Mm. Um, so you're always going to be sceptical as a fan seeing somebody coming in to replace somebody who is as good as Roy Keane. 
Um, but initially, um, it was a case of uh, Frank Clark turning around to me and said, well, look, you know, just be a little bit patient, see what the side's about, see how we work tactically. Um, and, you know, I was really, you know, on, on the sidelines watching for a couple of games. Um, and Frank just said to me, look, one thing I don't want you doing is going over the halfway line. Um, so it was one of those that um, I didn't score as many goals as what I did at previous clubs. But, um, you know, if the management want you to go and do a certain role, I was there to go and, uh, you know, sort it out. And uh, thankfully, uh, it all worked out pleasantly well, uh, especially the first season. And uh, I'm sure uh, the fans got to love me, as they did when they awarded me the, um, the player of the, the season as well. So, um, you know, it, it was a great year, to, to be honest. Yes, I'll ask you a few more about that um, in a minute. Just in general in your career, do you think your versatility was a help or a hindrance? Because I was trying to think before uh, when I was thinking of what I'd ask you. There aren't many players of that ilk now. I was thinking James Milner, Ashley Young, and that it's interesting that they're veterans. Players t- tend to stick quite rigidly to their positions now. How did it impact your career, do you think? Well, the uh, how it all really started off is um, when I moved to Holland as a as a youngster between the ages of nine and twelve. Uh, the club I was associated with, KVC Aranya, uh, they had a policy which a lot of Dutch clubs do have, is that they like to see players playing in different positions. You know, they like to to work on your weaker foot and though and so on and so on. Um, and um, it was a case that um, even at junior level, I played in virtually every position apart from as a goalkeeper. And um, it held me in good stead. And I always turn around to kids nowadays and, and, and scholars, etc., and, and say, well, what would you rather do? Would you rather be a little bit more versatile where a manager can go and slot you in here, there and everywhere? Or do you want to be a natural right back? And if you've got somebody in front of you, you might struggle to get into that side unless you're going to be actually a lot, lot better than that person. So with myself, you know, I have played goalkeeper twice uh, since uh, since Holland. Um, you know, notably one at Plymouth Argyle, one for Huddersfield Town when a keeper got sent off and a keeper got injured. Um, so I have fielded every position on the park, whether it be as a centre half, as a sweeper, left back, and so on and so forth. You know, I started my career at Plymouth Argyle as a, uh, a natural centre forward, um, and then came as a midfielder, a central midfielder, played at right back. And, um, you know, it, it's great to have that versatility. And, if there is a player, you know, back in the day where you used to have only like two, three subs at the time, somebody got injured, I could naturally go and slot into that position. If you had a player on the bench, you could come in and fulfil the position that I was playing at the time. Mm. Mm. I guess maybe because there's more subs now, it's less common. Um, were you any good in goal? I do love it when an outfield player goes in goal. Did you do well or not? Well, uh, the one against Plymouth, for Plymouth Argyle, I conceded uh, two goals in both games. Um, one at West Brom was actually a penalty. So um, I can't be at fault for that one because most goalkeepers don't save penalties anymore. Um, Plymouth Argyle was exactly the same. So uh, I enjoyed my time. And it was one of those cases that I always fancied myself as being um, a goalkeeper. And I used to go and do a lot of uh, work with Steve Grzovic when he was at Coventry City. But um, when I was a youngster, uh, I was a rugby player. And uh, so I had to have good hands. Uh, I was a natural fly half. And um, at 15, 16 years of, of age, I had an opportunity of, of playing rugby for the bigger clubs in, in the southwest. But, you know, I really wanted to play football. Uh, there was no money at rugby in rugby at that time. Uh, and so I made the right choice. But don't get me wrong, I still absolutely love rugby. You touched on your early years there. It's quite interesting. Were you, uh, from, are you from a military family? Is that how come you were in Holland? Is that what? Yeah, absolutely working? right. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, you know, I was born in West Germany. People still can't get to grips with the fact that if you're born abroad, then, you know, why are you not a naturalised German or, you know, Dutch or from Singapore or from Cyprus, whatever. Mm-hmm. But what happens is, is that you're born on a um, British hospital in, in a British area. Um, and it's one of those that, um, you know, you have two birth certificates, one to say that you were born where you were born, and another one to say that you are a British citizen. So, um, you know, we started over in Germany. I was only there for about six months, so I can't remember that. Spent a little time in England. And then naturally, I was brought up in Wales, um, where I spent a a lot of my childhood until I was nine years of age. And then uh, my father was transferred over to to Brunson over in uh, over in Holland. Um, My team that I supported then back in the days was Rhoda JC of Kirkrada. 
um, and I was the only uh, British player to play for KVC Aranya. So, um, so that's really where my football started. Um, albeit that, you know, when I went to school in uh, Klangowie School in, in Bridgend in, uh, in Wales, we weren't allowed to play football. Everything was either rugby or cricket orientated. You know, if we had a can, uh, that was OK. If it was a small ball, it was confiscated from the playground. So um, they were hard days. But, you know, I was brought up to, to love rugby. My, my, my brother used to take me to watch Bridgend Rugby Football Club uh, week in, week out. And, um, you know, that was my first love. Since I've finished playing football, I've gone back to my first love, which, which is rugby as well, you know? Hmm. Um, was your dad, uh, I, I assume your dad was on board with you playing for Wales, and I'm sure you wanted to. And was your dad on board with you being a footballer? Or did you want you to be a rugby player or serve in the military or something totally different, like a doctor or whatever? I don't know. To, to be honest with you, I didn't have a, an awful lot of support from my father. Um, he was one of those that uh, he, he saw me as a sportsman and it was one of those that I had to get on with what I was doing. If I needed a lift, I had to try and get somebody else to try and take me. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, those those days as a youngster were actually quite hard for myself, um, trying to fend for myself. And, um, you know, my father, he, you know, he's Welsh through and through, you know, born in Negrosillion, just outside of uh, Caerphilly. Um, and um, naturally, um, it was a case of, of playing for Wales. Um, I did have the um, opportunity when I was at Plymouth Argyle of joining up with the England under 18s. And the manager at the time called me into the office and said, look, you know, David, this is fantastic news. You're going to call, get called up for the England under 18s. You know, what do you think? And I said, I'm not interested. I said, I'm Welsh through and through, even though I wasn't born there. You know, I've spent time away from Wales. I said, um, you know, I was, and don't take this personally, everyone need, uh, with the podcast, I was brought up to hate the English. <laughs> um, but that is what it was back in the day. You know, my my teacher, Mr. Williams, he was Plaid Cymru and his everything was, uh, you know, Borda Pant, Borda uh, And it was like, you know, the Welsh thing back in the day. Um, you know, that certainly changed when I came to about 11, 12 years of age. Um, but um, in respect of uh, my father, you know, absolutely delighted and thoroughly, uh, you know, glad that I chose to play for Wales. My brother as well, who I, you know, um, have a lot of um, thoughts for, you know, he played rugby. He represented Cornwall, but, you know, he was born in uh, Fleur de Lis and, um, you know, I've got a lot of Welsh heritage. So, uh, so it's always going to be Wales for me. Mm, mm, interesting. Um, back to Forest then. That that first season under Frank. I mean, I don't. Rec I recall it didn't start well. Uh, it probably took until the October time or what, when Bahinan came in. I guess. What was it like in those early months? Did you feel like it wasn't going to work out or not? Well, I tell you, the first the first few games, I wasn't I wasn't involved. Um, yeah. It was it, it was a case that you know I was to to say and stand. And I can still remember uh, going to Oakwell to Barnsley. Uh, sitting in the stand and, and I can't remember the result I don't think it was a great result and thinking you know what, what am I doing here you know I've, I've, I've taken the decision of leaving a club in the Premier League to come into the first division but I knew that I had to be patient Frank would always you know put an arm around me and say look you know David please be patient you've got to have a little look and when you come and step in you know go and show them what you can go and do Yes, with uh, Lars Bohinen coming in, um, you know, what a great acquisition he was until it came to the winter time. Uh, and why I, why I say this is that uh, I still remember um, playing at home and uh, there was a scattering of snow around the, uh, the pitch. There was a little bit of green and we had the orange ball out. And um, after about five minutes, I'm thinking, well, what the hell's going on with, with Lars here? And he got substituted. And we didn't realise that he was colourblind. And um, <laughs> so um, he did say that he tried to uh, get into the Norwegian Army, uh, into the Norwegian Air Force, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but he failed because he was colourblind. So um, it was something that we, we, we laughed about and we joked about. But um, when you talk about Lars Bohinen, what a player he was. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly. What was Frank like as a manager? Was he perfect for that kind of dressing room with... Like you say, he had a lot of senior players, a lot of big characters. Was he the right man to come in and almost, I think he's been on this podcast before, I got the impression he kind of let you senior players police the dressing room yourselves. Yeah, I, I have to be honest, I absolutely love Frank Clark. I think what a great gentleman he was, what a great servant he was for Nottingham Forest, not only as a, a player, 
uh, but also as a manager as well. And obviously now moved to the, the boardroom. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of time for Frank Clark. And uh, yes, it was a case that, you know, letting big players manage it. You know, we had some players, um, as, as I mentioned, like with, with, with Stuart Pearce, Lars Bohinen coming in, Colin Cooper, Steve Chettle, you know, even Chets was a, a younger lad. You know, he still had, you know, the admiration and in and around the, uh, the changing room. Uh, Steve Stoney and Wone, um, people like that, you know, characters, uh, very confident. But obviously what happened the, the previous year, it took a little bit of time for everything to click in with myself, with Lars, um, and uh, things started to materialise. And, um, you know, to get promoted that first year after the start that we had, um, isn't it very similar to a couple of years from Nottingham Forest, you know, where all of a sudden, like, you know, they were bottom of the uh, the championship and next thing they're getting promoted through the uh, the playoffs so, and, and where they are now in the Premier League. Um, you had, uh, obviously you had the international quality and, you know, yourself, Stuart Pearce, uh, Steve Stone would go on to play for England. Stan Collymore was kind of the X Factor player. Um, I've asked a few people about him, and it sounds like he was a bit of a nightmare, but you let him get away with it because he was so good. What, what would you say about Stan? Uh, yeah, I think those uh, that line is about right. Um, you know, Stan was a, a rule to himself. Um, I can remember um, rooming with him. Well, I was told I had to room with him. <laughs> you know, Frank turned around to me and said, look, you know, David, you're one of the more sensible ones. You know, I want you to look after uh, to Stan. Um, and, you know, make sure that he's, you know, on time and this and whatever. And um, this one night we were going off uh, horse trotting and uh, Stan decided that he wasn't going. And I said, well, look, you know, what am I supposed to do? He said, well, go out the door, say you haven't seen me. So, um, and I don't particularly like lying. And uh, Liam O'Kane came up to me. He said, you know, where, where's Stan? And I said, I haven't got a clue. Um, but that night... The alarm bells were going. He'd broken in from a fire exit. He'd been out seeing some young lady. Um, <laughs> and I just I just had to say to Frank Clark, I said, I, I just can't room with him anymore. <laughs> I, you know, he's, he's broken all the rules and I don't want to, you know, be a person attached to that. Um, but if you look at Stan Collimore, you know, with what he achieved with the, the, the fee that came in from, from South End, um to what he achieved for, for Nottingham Forest is you know uh, is there is it's history isn't it mm, mm. that's an interesting dynamic you coming from that military background I imagine your bedroom was very neat as a child because your parents made it be so was it an odd couple vibe with Stan where you got on or did he literally drive you so crazy you just couldn't deal with it Oh, it's just the fact that he kept on deciding that he wanted to go out the exits, the emergency exits, and do the fire alarms and this, that, whatever. And um, it was one of those that I just thought, well, you know, enough is enough. Um, I think he wasn't having a particularly great time at the time. Um, mm. You know, I still remember um, travelling up from uh, Leamington Spa, where I was living at the time, um, and going up the motorway to Nottingham to tra training. And I saw fr um, Stan's car coming the opposite way down by Leicester Services. Mm. So I've got in, I've got into training and, uh, you know, Frank's gone, oh, well, un unfortunately, um, Stan's not going to be here today. Uh, he's gone to see his mother over in Cannock. And I thought, and I said to Piercy, I said, hold on, I passed him going south on the Leicester services. He was going down to London. Mm. So that was Stan. You know, he may have made a, a couple of different rules, but the rules were all for Stan. But um you know, you can't knock the guy, you know, with what he's going to have done. Listen, you're always going to have somebody who has a, a little bit of a life outside of football. Um, as long as that when he comes in, you know, he's doing his job. Uh, he's not causing any aggravation on the field or in the training ground, etc. Uh, and just scoring goals. And that's what Stan was all about. Yeah, I mean, you, you got promoted in the end and then you go on the following season and it's you know, an unbelievable season one of the great seasons for the club finishing third I don't know if you recall going into that campaign was that I don't I can't imagine that was a realistic aim what were you looking for that season after promotion I think it's the same with uh, with a lot of clubs and I think if you are Steve Cooper now uh, having <laughs> got promoted from the championship it's all about stability um, mm. into the you know into the Premier League and I'm sure that if you'd have asked Steve Cooper you know, would you have finished like, you know, two places above relegation at the end of the uh, season? He would have said, yeah, I would have done. We know that they've uh, acquired a certain amount of players, but 
back in those days, you know, you have to build, you have to learn to walk before you can run. And it wasn't one of those cases. And, you know, when all of a sudden Frank is starting to add other players into the equation, you know, it was a good squad and mm. uh, it was an excellent season. Mm. I must have skirt back because I meant to ask you about winning player of the year the previous year. That must have meant a lot to you because, you know, we've spoken about Stan and Stuart Pearce and those quality of players. And you were the guy who did a lot of the unselfish work. So to get that recognition, it, it must have you know been quite touching for you. It was, um, you know, to, to get that award um, at the end of the season, you know, as you're right to say, big people like Piercy, uh, Stan Collimore, who's had a, an excellent season scoring all those goals. Um, but just to have the uh, the backing and the admiration from all the uh, Nottingham Forest fans was just a, a fantastic accolade for myself. Uh, I just wish Stan would have hung around the awards a little bit longer to appreciate it. Uh, he did walk out at the end, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, but that's Stan, you know, I, I, I don't uh, have any grudges against that. But, um, you know, it's one of those that's who could have won it. Maybe Stan could have won it. Maybe Piercy could have won it. Um, but when my name was called out, I was just A, flabbergasted, but B, absolutely delighted. Um, going back to the following season then, was it a bit of a case of lightning in a bottle that that team you had was perfectly balanced, as I recall. You, you know, you, you had Stone and Wone on the flanks, yourself and Lars, and then Brian Roy came in and he was a, you know, he was a Dutch international who just played yeah. in the World Cup and he sounds like a real character and reading up on his days, <laughs> sounds like he's got real problems. But, I mean, that side was just perfect for that time, do you think? Yeah, I would say when you when you look at the um, you know that that front six as you'd like to call it, uh, and then when you have fullbacks who want to make those overlapping runs, mm. you know you have the security of uh, you know Coops and Chets at the back, you know Norman goal, um, you know it was a really good side, um, a really good side, um, and it was one of those as, as mentioned before, learning to walk before you can run. Frank adding you know certain players as we went along, and, and you mentioned about Brian Roy. Um, you know what an unbelievable player he was. Um, I still remember him the the second, not the first preseason or well, the first time we saw him, but the second preseason that we uh, we had Brian Roy, and we always used to talk, take take the mick about his fitness. And um, we decided that, or Pete Edwards decided that we were going to go and run round, you know, the, the water centre and all that lot. And um, Brian just went running off, and we were all like going, "Hey, hey, he's really fit this year. He's really fit." <laughs> Then all of a sudden, after about half a mile, Brian started coming back to us and we started going towards him. And then we just completely left him. And we thought, well, maybe this isn't quite true. You know, maybe he hasn't working, been working hard in, in pre-season. And about three or four minutes later, we saw this motorcyclist go flying past us, thinking, what on earth's going on here? And, they, and he had you know, a passenger with him. And he stopped about another four or 500 yards further up. And crash helmet came off turned around and it's Brian Roy and he's gone now catch me you <laughs> like, he said I told you I was fit <laughs> you know so he was a, an unbelievable character to to have in the changing room and um you know good fun and and what a player what a what a wonder of a left foot he had along with Woney as well you know Woney had a, a great left pe peg as well you know but uh Brian was um, as you said a Dutch international who came in and you know worked and combined really well with Stan. Hmm. Is it a bit of an annoyance now looking back that you finished third? I mean I don't know when the third place finish for the Champions League came in but that that money if you had a guy in the Champions League would have changed the football club and obviously Stan would go on to leave uh, and things would kind of dis deteriorate a bit. Do, uh, as players do you think oh I wish we got in the Champions League that year? I, I can't remember when it changed to be honest. No, I can't remember when it when it changed, but um, you know, uh, it, it, it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, you have to go what the rules are, what UEFA are saying, what FIFA are saying. You know, I still remember when um, I was at Coventry City, and uh, we won the FA Cup back in nineteen eighty seven, hmm. and uh, we qualified for UEFA. But unfortunately, that year Heysel happened, hmm. and all the British clubs were not allowed to go and enter into into Europe. Um, and so that was a, a bit of a kick in the teeth for you know the club at the time. You know that could have brought in extra revenue, 
Um, but the one thing that I had, I was a, an international football player anyway, so I had the opportunities of, of playing abroad and playing against you know national sides. Um, but when you talk about uh, the Champions League and the UEFA, um, you know we, we qualified as we did in third place, and um, you know to to do and, and get where we got into the quarterfinals, and uh, unfortunately lose to to, to Bayern Munich. Um, you know the aggregate score was you know not particularly great. You know seven two, um, but to think that we got to the quarterfinals of the FA Cup that year as well. Um, mm. You know we had a great season, mm. and you did that having you lost Stan to to Liverpool at that point. Did it feel like a start of a decline there or not? Because as you say, you did have a strong season. I think you finished ninth in the league that season and you mentioned the cup form. Did you still feel like you could do well without Stan? Yeah, I'm saying Kevin Campbell came in, I believe. Um, yeah. You know, and Casey, you know, again, what a great uh, player and what a great advert for, for a footballer. Um, you know, again, character in the changing room. Um, I think, I'm trying to think, was, was Salenzi there at the time at that he you was, know, he was. Frank, Frank's spoken about signing him as a source of great regret. For I think he said he was the only player he never saw in person. And he took a bit of a no, punt. Yeah, he saw. He, he actually, you know, because uh, I think one day uh, a couple of us actually went and saw Frank and just said, "Well, you know, where on earth have you got this guy from?" And he said, "Well, we've only seen him, seen him off of VHS." Hmm. So, um, but you know, when when you talk about Andrew Salenzi. Um, again, what a what a great man he was in the changing room. We know things weren't going particularly well for, for Andrea. Um, but hey, listen, you know, he played for Napoli, he got the one Italian cap, he played with Maradona. Yeah. So we so he couldn't have been that bad. Mm. Um but you know, he came over to Nottingham Forest, it didn't work out for him. And as we've seen lots of players over the years, you know, they transfer to another club, it doesn't suit him. And and things you know don't particularly happen, and and for Andrea it didn't particularly happen. Mm. Um, but when you lose somebody like um, for Stan Collymore, um, you know scored lots of goals um, to go to Liverpool, you know it's a, a huge dynamic that you've lost. Mm. True, true. Um, the following season uh, was obviously a very difficult one. Frank left, the team got relegated. It was your last season at the club. Yeah. Was that just a real nightmare one for you? Uh, it was, you know. Uh, you know, as I said, I, you know, I absolutely love Frank Clark. Um, you know, a lot of respect for this uh, this gentleman. Um, there were a lot of things going in, in and around. I was having off field issues, uh, which I don't particularly like to to discuss. Um, you know, I felt that some of the international players that we had uh, were not pulling their weight, um, and then obviously with uh, with Dave Bassett coming in. Um, you know, things didn't go as well as what he was hoping for. You know, we had Dean Saunders in the room as well. Again, what a great character he was. Um, but unfortunately, it just fell to pieces. Um, and it was a sad day, really. You know, I ended up moving on to, to Huddersfield. Um, you know, I was a certain age as well. I was, what, 34, something like that. Mm. Um, so at 34, I think, well, OK, you know, my career is still continuing. You know, disappointed to to left left Nottingham Forest, but you know such great memories um, at the club, uh, and still have a you know a huge fondness for them now. You didn't want to go then. You didn't feel like it was the right time to move on. You you would have stayed if the opportunity was there. Yeah, I would have done. But I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not a great lover of Dave Bassett. Uh, yeah. Never have been. Never will be. Um, and it was uh, a totally different style of play that he wanted to to instill. Uh, and you know we we know about the success that he's had with with clubs you know down the line, but that wasn't the way Nottingham Forest have been born and bred. You know it was playing the ball. It was you know training sessions invariably were five a sides. Nothing really changed from when Brian Clough was in charge. Um, you know Liam O'Kane did most of the training. You know Frank would be there. You know what a great motivator he was. Mm -hmm. um, but you know when you had. Um, you know, Dave Bassett coming in, it was a case of mm, not too sure. Is that one of the things that we as fans don't necessarily see, do you think? Like yourself, you mentioned you had off-field issues, the manager didn't quite gel, things weren't quite right in the dressing room. As fans, we only see the 90 minutes on the pitch. Do, do you think that we don't always appreciate how much goes into those 90 minutes working or, or going terribly wrong? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, you know, nowadays we have social media. So a lot of things get put into social media. A lot of things are, 
you know, uh, are, are made up. Um, all the stuff going on, you know, about Steve Cooper last year. And, you know, there were a lot of people uh, in the press wanting him to, to get sacked. Um, and, you know, especially one paper, which I don't particularly like, they were having a, a right good dig at Steve. Mm. And uh, I just felt, you know, that is so, so wrong. Um, it's just good that uh, Maranakis was able to go and back him and just say, well, look, you know, he's got a new contract, etc. Uh, and things have worked out really, really well. But back in the day, you know, there wasn't so much social media. You didn't get to hear what was going on. You can go onto certain websites and you can have predictions what the, the side's going to be. And they're, they're basically probables. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was always going to be difficult back in back in those days uh, when things are not going particularly well um, because it's all in-house and you're hoping that other players can help you, etc. But in respect of my issue, you know, that was a personal one. Um, and the only person really I spoke to was KB. You know, uh, KB and I have been, you know, very good friends at Nottingham Forest and we've been very good friends ever since. Um, but uh, you've always got somebody to, to lean on, to talk to if you want to. Um, but when things are going particularly wrong, you don't know if the person that you're talking to, what their situation is. Mm. So uh, mm. it can become quite difficult. But you're right in what you're saying. The fans don't see it. You know, everything's all in-house. Um, and so... People turn around to me and say, well, you know, would you rather be playing today um, or would you rather play back in the day that when you were playing? You know, for social media side, you know, I wouldn't want to be playing nowadays. For the financial side, yes, I would want to be playing. Um, you know, and that's a difficult thing. You know, I had a, a good chat um, the other day with a guy called Steve Kinsey, who uh, was a teammate of mine at, at Man City. Mm-hmm. And we were saying about uh, players nowadays, you know, could the olden player older player now cope with the modern day football and the answer is yes Hmm. could the modern day football player cope with the olden days i don't think so because things have changed things have changed pitches have changed you know Hmm. gosh i'm saying if you go back to the 1980s look at the pitches that we played on Hmm. you know they were horrific you know derby county just across the way you know that pitch was horrific Hmm. you know qpr had the plastic pitch you know i went and saw um Forest at Crystal Palace, you know, towards the back end of the season, uh, and I went on the pitch to talk to uh, to Dean Kiley, the um, the uh, goalkeeping coach for Crystal Palace, and I said to him, I said, "Look at this pitch; it's unbelievable." You know, at the end of the season, there's not even a mark on it. He said, "Well, you know what, Philo?" He said, "We're we're we're pulling it up and putting a new one down." I said, "Why?" <laughs> but, so the pitches that we played on back in the day, they sometimes they were horrendous. Mm. You know, um, you know, you go to Peterborough, for example, when we went to Peterborough and places like Notts County, you know, uh, some of these places that we went to, you know, it was one of those. You had to make sure that your second touch was decent. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about modern day Forest. You've touched on it there. You, used to, you commentate for the, the Premier League regularly for the international feed. So obviously yeah. I haven't seen you because I never watch streams. Um, but what did you make of Forest? last season in the games you you saw in terms of mostly the tactics uh i, I guess initially what because they went about it in kind of a rigid way to stay up do, do you do you respect that and think it was the right way to go yeah absolutely right you know um first and foremost you know people were, were hammering you know coops for uh the amount of players that he brought in mm. um and if you look at the season it's a good job he did because the amount of injuries that forest sustained you know, was was unbelievable. And even if you take the, the last game of the season at Crystal Palace, uh, I could go through a list of players, you know, and I could pick an, a, an 11 of the first team players who could be playing, mm. you know, who were on the uh, on the sidelines. Um, something had to change. You know, I, I, I went to the Leeds game. Um, and we're talking about games towards the back end of the season, you know, um, and I thought against Leeds, we were very fortunate. Uh, mm. Kayla Navas was in great form. Uh, Leeds squandered quite a few opportunities, and that was Jesse Marsh's last game. Mm. You know, got got the result. Uh, I think Brennan Johnson scored a, a, a good goal that day. Yeah. Um, and we're thinking, well, you know, hopefully we can kick on from here. Uh, it didn't materialise, you know, and I'm looking back and thinking, well, you know, when did it start to click? When did it start to, to go into, like, you know, the chance where we think, well, Forrest are going to stay up? And I thought the game was Liverpool away. Yeah. Um, you know, to think that scoring two goals away at Anfield 
and then to lose to Salah in the 70 something minute you know was an unbelievable response and then played Brighton and um, you know Brighton had that uh, extra time game against Manchester United in the FA Cup mm. uh, and to go and win that 1-3-1 but I, you know and that then put us into a situation where you know we can move on from there and if you like take the last six games only got defeated once in those last six including three victories and the one game they got beat was at Brentford which I was doing work for PLP mm. um, and I thought then tactically didn't get it particularly right um, you know the situation with the, the injuries and the, the single substitutions um, but I'm not here to question Steve Cooper. He's by far a fantastic manager. It's a, by far a better manager than, than I'll ever be. Um, so I would never, never, ever doubt him. But I know that he was disappointed with the way things materialised. But I look at the, the situation, how the two goals went in. And Ivan Tony, you know, had done absolutely nothing that game. Mm. You know, and he goes to take a free kick. And uh, the wall splits. I think Kuati splits. Mm. Um, people are knocking Kalen Havis, but I can't knock Kalen Havis for that. You know, at the end of the day, it's happened. The wall shouldn't split. And then uh, Ren and Lodi up against the silver. You know, Lodi's left footed, the silver's left footed. You think, oh, well, hold on. I want to keep him onto my right foot. I want to send him down the line. But Lodi changes his body angles and allows the silver to come in and then just hammers the ball in. Again, Koyati could have done better. But with Lodi, there was a couple of mistakes there. And I thought, is this going to be the catalyst of you know what went wrong? And I met a, a few Forest play, uh, uh, supporters after the game, and you could see how distraught they were. And I just said, look, you know, keep believing, keep believing, you know. And thankfully, uh, with the results, especially the one against Arsenal, um, you know, got Forest out of a, a very tricky situation. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. one defeat in their last six. Um, Steve Cooper would have taken that. Um, mm -hmm. But against, say, against Crystal Palace, I thought they played really well. But I thought as well, players came into the four um, towards the back end of the season. We know what a, an expensive uh, signing MGW was. Um, and, you know, his last half a dozen games, he was superb. The ball that he put in for one week for the goal he scored against Crystal Palace was absolutely sublime. But you look at a one year, look at how many goals he scored in the last half, half a dozen games, mm. you know. Um, I have to admit that when he first came in from uh, from Berlin and I saw him play, I thought he was very wooden. I thought he was very laden, but I didn't think he was fit. Mm. Um, then he's had injuries going along the way as well. But, um, you know, in the last half dozen games, people came to the fore and started performing and getting results. Um, and yes, 30 odd players that he signed, you know, he had to go and do that. Otherwise, he might be in a situation where we're in the championship now. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's going to be more of a, a revolving door to try and get these pieces in the jigsaw to find out exactly what squad he wants. You know, and it might take time. It might take money. It might take the availability of who is around. You know, we, we're looking at players who've gone out the uh, the, door, the revolving door already. You know, we're looking at, um, you know, who's going to come in. You know, there's talk about, um, I'm trying to think, of the, uh, is it Drakowski, the, the, the goalkeeper? Uh, possibly being one. Um, you're talking about Sessignon being another. You talk about Ahia Nacho, potentially. Mm. Um, you know, Hudson Adoy. Mm. Uh, I believe that he's talking to uh, or potentially talking to, to Nottingham Forest. Um, and these are the things that, uh, you know, Steve Cooper's got to be looking at. He knows Hudson Adoy anyway from the England under 17s. You know, he knows MGW from the under 17s as well. So he knows what a good player he, he is. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that. Coops would get the best out of Adoy as well. I was going to ask: Is there a particular player you admire from the current setup? Then I get the impression it's it's Gibbs White, or, or is there someone else that you particularly uh, think is a, a good player? Yeah, I like Gibbs White. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. Um, when uh, when we signed him to start off with for that vast amount of money, uh, and for the lack of goals that he scores, I wouldn't say that he's a you know a you know, 10, 12, 15 goals a season player. Mm. But what he gives you, um, was he have like eight assists this year? Something along those lines? Mm. Maybe maybe a little bit more in the Premier League? But he gives you an all-round performance. You know, we know we're not in the forest. 
they like to counterattack. It's how we used to do it back in the day as well. You know, when you had the likes of Roy, when you had the likes of Collamore, you know, I wouldn't turn around and say Woney was electric, but, you know, he had good pace, he had good stamina. Stoney was good pace, etc. You know, Lars as well. So counter-attacking skills, you know, superb. And when you had the likes of uh, Gibbs White, the one he, for me, improved immeasurably towards the back end of the season and showed what pace he had. Brennan Johnson, another player. You know, and when you have somebody like Danilo as well, who can get himself into that advanced position, you know, you've got Lottie on one side, who can, you know, get himself up there as well. You know, it, it was the time where you had players who could be very expansive. And um, and that's what it was all about. But yeah, Morgan Gibbs, I, you know, I like, I have to go with Brennan Johnson because he's Welsh. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting season for, for Nottingham Forest, how they, they go about the business, what sort of players that they're, going to accrue into the uh, into the ground um, and what money is going to be available from the chairman as well. Mm. I mean, without having the squad in place, it's difficult to say exactly where they can finish. But do you think they'll be comfortable this season? I mean, it's not it's a little disrespectful to say the promoted teams aren't very good, but they, they look like they face an uphill task. A few of them and Everton have got financial worries and Wolves are selling players. So, are you worried about Forest going down, or or do you uh, or do you think they'll finish mid table? What what would you be looking at? I, I would like to think that they would finish mid table. If they could mm. finish mid table and above, superb. Um, we know that uh, sides that come up from the championship, they've got that momentum already going. Mm. Um, so, you look at the likes of Luton, for example. You know, you think that they are going to be one of those who are going to be relegated straight away. But you look at their um, their form at Kenilworth Road. Hard place to go. Mm. Uh, very, very tight. Uh, they've got a lot of players who are strong, athletic. They're powerful. Got two lads up front who can score goals. They've got a back unit who are tall. Again, very, very physical. So Kenilworth Road is going to be really hard to try and get points. Same as Nottingham Forest. You, you look at Nottingham Forest, you know, they finished 10th in the table for home form last year. Away form, finished bottom. Mm. You know, Conceded the most goals. Uh, no, sorry, I'll rephrase that. I think Leeds scored the most goal, uh, conceded the most goals. But I think the the differential between four and against was uh, a lot higher for Forest. Eight points total. I think there was only um, the one victory. Was it the one victory at Southampton? Yes, potentially. Yeah. Yes. Um, and how many goals did they score? Eleven. Mm. You know, eleven goals in nineteen games. Mm. You know, and that is something really that uh, Coops and his, his staff, you know, Tatey and Reedy, and great to see that Stephen Reed is coming back, by the way. Mm. Um, you know, that is something that they're going to have to look at really very, very carefully. Mm. Mm. You're obviously still very well informed about Forest, and I guess you have to be about the whole Premier League for the work you do. Um, you said we a couple of times. Do you consider Forest your club? Because you had stints sizable stints at quite a few clubs so a forest your club or is there a clutch of clubs that you kind of no it's, it's, it's one of those you know when, when i'm talking you know I'm, I'm very respectful um you know to to all the clubs i played for and you know whether i've done a a podcast for for manchester city or or coventry it's always a we because i feel associated with the club yeah um people always ask me uh the question you know what club do you support and if you know me you know the answer. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just say to you now, um, it's always been a difficult one because, you know, being brought up with rugby and, and whatever um, mm. and having travelled around here, there and everywhere, um, you know, it wasn't a case of, you know, being a fan. I call a fan being somebody who goes to games week in, week, week out. Mm. You know, I've, I've never had the opportunity because of being at 16 years of age um, you know, I, I moved to Plymouth. Prior to that, I lived in England. I lived in Wales. I lived in Holland. So I moved around a bit, you know. But the first clubs that I, you know, started supporting, as I mentioned before, was Rhoda JC of Kirkrada. You know, they had two players in the in the World Cup finals back in 1978. Uh, Jan Youngblood, who's in goal, and Dick Naninga, who came off the, the bench to score. You know, they lost that game against Argentina over in Buenos Aires. Um, so that was one of the first clubs that I, I really followed you know and i used to go and watch them play uh Bayern munich was another side um because invariably we used to spend our holidays down in bavaria uh down in austria um but 
the very first time I ever went to Bayern was with nine, uh, Nottingham Forest back in 1996. And even though I was a, an international footballer and played against Germany on several occasions, this opportunity to play in the Olympic Stadium was a dream, dream come true for me. Um, so to go somewhere that you've always wanted to go and do, you know, albeit that the result was not the greatest one, 2 1, Steve Chettle, great header, good free kick, David. Um, but um, it was, you know, I've always loved my football. I've always loved my rugby, you know, and I follow the Crusaders rugby, uh, which is from New Zealand down in Canterbury. Um, and, um, you know, they've won their seventh title on, on the spin. Um, so, you know, I, sometimes I, I annoy my wife because I get up at five past four in the morning to go and watch <laughs> Canter uh, the Crusaders play. Um, but in respect of, um, you know, the football, I'm very respectful to all the clubs that I've played for. Uh, and I feel that, you know, I'm part and parcel of their history. And um, every time I've come to Nottingham Forest or Coventry or Plymouth, Man City, Huddersfield, you know, I, I have a lot of respect from a lot of people who, you know, enjoyed my time when I was at, when I was at these clubs. Are you still in touch with many former Forest teammates or is it a bit like any job in any walk of life where maybe you just stay in touch with two or three people for years to come and the rest kind of drift yeah. into the ether and you say hello when you see them in the street or at functions? Yeah, it's 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 always a difficult one because, you know, I'm sure when if you talk to Steve Chettle, for example, he will have his own little clique mm. of uh, ex Nottingham Forest players, you know, but Steve Chettle was virtually a Nottingham Forest player right from the start, right to the end. You know, saying you know, we can talk about other players, you know, Nigel Jempson. And I know that he's been at Sheffield Wednesday and places like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he has this massive affinity and he does a great ambassadorial role at Nottingham Forest as well, does Jamo. Mm -hmm. uh, same as Mark Crossley. You know, I'm in touch with Mark Crossley. Um, I'm in touch with KB, obviously. Um, Woney I've been on the phone to, um, you know, congratulating him at the end of the season. Um, it was going to be a tough one. You know, was it going to be Everton? Was it going to be Nottingham Forest? <laughs> and I'm really pleased at the end. You know, I know Daichi as well, obviously Stoney. Um, you know, so I was delighted that, you know, the guys over Everton were able to maintain their Premier League uh, status as well as Nottingham Forest. So it, it, it is difficult because, um, you know, when you move around and I've, I've been to about seven or eight clubs, um, is that you manage to like you know befriend certain people, um, but you know I saw Stuart Pierce at um, uh, John Sillett's uh, memorial, um, was having a good good old chat with him. Uh, Mark Crossley, you know through through Facebook and things like that. Um, but there are players like you know through clubs you know that you you keep in touch with. Uh, yeah, I surprised. I thought Leicester would get out of it. I must admit, I thought Everton would probably go, but Leicester just seemed to sleepwalk into relegation. It was a very weird one with the quality of players they had. Yeah, um, it was. It was weird, wasn't it? You know, and um, you know, I, I was surprised that uh, Brendan Rodgers took the decision to to go and leave, and then Dean Smith coming in. Um, but again, like you know, I, I look at the media side. You know, regarding Daichi and Roney at uh, Everton, they're all saying like, you know, they're getting sacked at the end of the year and this, that, whatever. But he's come in, he's come and done a great job. You know, they didn't have a, an out and out striker, did they? Mm. You know, um, it was one of those that Ellis Sims was having to come in and do the the role. But um, they've done a great job there. But I'm not bothered about Everton. I'm, all I'm bothered about is Nottingham Forest. Last question before I let you go. I know you've done coaching um, at youth level. I think you work in an academy or you have an academy. Did you not mm -hmm. fancy management or senior coaching at any point? Uh, when, I, when, I, when I came out um, of, uh, of football, I've always wanted to, to be a coach. I've always wanted to work with, uh, with, with children um, and to see how the progression goes. And uh, I've been very fortunate during my career that uh, I've been able to see a, a lot of players make their first team debuts and go on and, and do better things. Um, and, you know, when, when you get to see him a little bit later, you know, I saw Will Hughes down at Crystal Palace. I was with him at Derby County. Um, it was just uh, great to see how he's, you know, evolved as a, as a player from when, you know, I had him as a, a 13, 14 year old at, at Derby County to see him where he is now at 28 years of age. Um, you know, and so I look after, you know, players, careers as, as well. Um, and, just seeing how they, you know, mature from being a, a young man to a man. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of players who I've been involved in who've, who've gone on to better things, who's gone on to, like, you know, be international footballers. Um, and it's, it's great to see, you know, how they mature and how they evolve and how they move on. 
Uh, well, David, it's been a real pleasure uh, hearing all the stuff about your career and your thoughts on the game today. Uh, it'd be great to have you back on. Actually, you were really interesting. Um, thanks to everyone who's watched along. We'll be back later in the week with some transfer chat and then a different guest next week. But uh, in the meantime, thank you very much. And we shall see you soon. <laughs>